working off the previous video, we're going to go ahead and continue and move into the exploit phase of this exploit. I'm going to go ahead and show you that our initial code works as we ported it over to an MSF exploit. At this point, we're going to see the exact same thing we saw when we were doing our fuzzing. We were able to successfully overwrite SEH with the exact characters that we're looking for. And that's all that we're trying to accomplish in this phase. So we'll go ahead and restart the debugger and move on to more exciting stuff. Because we aren't overriding EIP directly, which would result in a full code ex execution, we must find an appropriate executable instruction already available to us. We can use the MSF PE scan to go ahead and locate one for us. We can use system DLLs, EL EXEs, or the application EXE, uh, which is what we're going to go ahead and use in this point. I've chosen one slightly different than the examples you've seen. Because of Andianness, we need to go ahead and put this in the correct order. Because SEH is in play here, we can't exactly overwrite EIP. However, we can't control what gets passed to it. We've chosen to use a pop pop red here, and let me explain why we're doing that. The pointer to the next SEH record is located at ESP plus 8. By sending a pop pop return, we will pop off the top two items of the stack, which are four bytes each, which will return execution back to the EIP register. EIP points to our next SEH field, which we have already overwritten, and then we will include our first jump, which we'll see here in just a few. We'll go ahead and reload our module and run the exploit again. It will quickly crash, and then we'll go ahead and view the SEH chain. As you can see, the memory address that we chosen for our pop pop return is populated in there, in the correct order, 7811CA. Here, I'm going to go ahead and set a breakpoint by pressing F2. You can see that that's where it's set because it's highlighted in red. Shift F9 at this point will go ahead and return execution back to the debugger, in which case we can now step through and see our pop pop return. We can see that we've, we've been able to jump and move into our next four bytes of area, which is we're going to overwrite here with our first jump. As we just saw, we were able to land somewhere that gave us four bytes, basically our next SEH instruction. Four bytes is useful, but it's not good enough for us to do anything useful with. So we need to go ahead and override our next SEH pointer with a jump instruction. Because we're occupying another four bytes here, we need to include our offset uh, to include those four bytes, making it smaller to 10356. Go ahead and update the line here that, that sends that in as our payload. And then send that over to the target and see what happens. Here in our corrupt entry, we can see that we were able to overwrite with our command, the EBF99090. The 9090 at the end are simply just padding, and, and we could have filled anything we wanted in there. This is the visualization of the previous explanation on pop pop ret. When we return execution back into our debugger, we can step through the pop pop ret. And we see that we end up at EBF9, which is our our overwrite, and then we have a short jump, which is what that gives us. That short jump is going to give us an additional 5 bytes, which is all we need to get into our shellcode. Here, I've updated our near instruction set, included it into our payload, and updated the offset to include that. A quick restart of the exploit will show that, and we'll walk through that real quick. Again, Shift F9 will return execution, and F7 will walk us through. There's our pop pop ret into our first jump. The short jump will let us jump back five bytes, which then contains our five byte jump sequence, which will take us up to somewhere near the top of the stack, which we will see will be contained with code that our buffer. In this case, it's all 41s. Now we need to modify that so it's something useful which will actually get us into our shellcode. As you can see, we've landed somewhere safely inside of our initial buffer. We replace our 41s with 90s for our NOPs, and we adjust our payload length to include any size payload that we want to send from the MSF payload. The payload.encoded.length will give us the ability to determine that on the fly. Examination of the crash again, as we walk through it, will show us the exact same thing that we saw before, except now, we should see that after our jumps, we end up safely inside of our NOP sled, which will then deliver us into our shellcode. 
Here's the end of our slide, resulting in us ending up in our shellcode. Now we can change our payload to something a little bit more fun. I've chosen the Windows Shell Reverse TCP for this particular exploit. I'm going to go ahead and restart it, and we see that even though we're sending our payload, nothing is exactly happening yet. This is one of those frustrating things about something called bad characters. After several attempts, the exploit does actually land and send the shell code in. As we can see here, we were able to successfully send our stage 1 and stage 2 payload and gain a, a shell into the remote system. Bad characters are characters that get mangled during execution on the remote system. This is a very frustrating piece of the actual exploit right and requires us to determine each and every character to exclude from our shellcode so that we can have a reliable exploit every time. I'll cover that in a later video. Thanks for watching.